Hello and welcome back. In this video we're going to begin discussing something called kinematics. And basically what kinematics is, is it's the study of the motion of objects. So we'll be talking about the relationship between things like the change in an object's position, its velocity, and its acceleration. Now I want to start off with some basic definitions. So displacement is a vector that describes the change in an object's position. Remember, we talk about the change in an object's position because the laws of physics are the same everywhere. So, for example, again, if I like drop a ball off of the roof of Western Abemarle, it will fall to, fall to the ground in the exact same way that it would fall if I dropped it off of any other building. So the exact position of the object doesn't matter so much, but it's the change in the object's position that we're trying to describe because this is something, it's a general thing it's going to be the same everywhere. When we talk about displacement, we denote it like this, with this delta x. So this triangle here, this is a Greek letter, delta, and we'll be using this notation very frequently in, in this class. And this delta, it, basically what this means is it means the change in whatever quantity that follows it. So you could literally read this as the change in x or the change in my position, where x, this vector x, is describing my position. So we define the displacement as a vector quantity like this. So my x component of the vector is just the change in my x position, so it's the final x position minus the initial x, and the y is the final y value minus the initial y. So displacement describes how far you've moved and in what direction. But now I want to be able to describe how quickly I've moved in this direction. And so for this we use the velocity. So again, velocity is a vector, so it has magnitude and direction. We denote this with a V with a little arrow above it to indicate that it is a vector. And most of the time in this class we'll be talking about something that's called average velocity. And the average velocity is the defined as the change in the object's position divided by change in time. So it's the change in the object's position divided by the amount of time it takes for the object to move through this displacement. Now one thing I should point out about average velocity is that the average velocity is always going to point in the same direction as the displacement. Right? We can see this very easily. Right? I could rewrite this as 1 over delta t times my displacement. And remember that when we multiply a scalar by a vector, uh, the vector is either going to point in the same direction or it'll point in the opposite direction. Since delta t is always positive, because it's the change in time, we're always multiplying a positive number by the displacement. So this vector will always point parallel to the displacement. Now, one thing I do want to talk briefly about is instantaneous velocity. So let me give you like an example. So imagine you drive from you know, home to school, okay, and maybe you travel like five miles and it takes you ten minutes to get to school. Okay, so from that we could calculate you know, your velocity using this equation right here. So if we know the direction that you're traveling and how far and how long it takes you to get there, we could calculate your average velocity. But obviously, as you drive from home to school, your instantaneous velocity, so the velocity you're traveling at at any particular instant, is constantly changing. So for example, when you push on the gas pedal, you're going to be accelerating and your velocity will increase. When you push on the brake, you're going to be slowing down, right? When you turn, right, the direction of your velocity is going to be changing. So how do we describe the velocity that you're moving at at any particular instant? Well, basically what we do is we calculate your average velocity over a very, very short interval of time, right? So if I want to know how, you're, how fast you're traveling at a particular instant, I calculate your average velocity over like the next millisecond or something like that, over a very short period of time. And if we take the limit of the average velocity as delta t goes to zero, then we wind up with what's called the instantaneous velocity. So this is the velocity you're moving at at the instant. Okay, and it turns out that this delta uh, position over delta t, if we take the limit as delta t goes to zero, this is what we call a derivative. So your instantaneous velocity is the derivative of your position with respect to time. And this is something you'll learn about in calculus course. It's beyond what we need to know for, cap, uh, for AP Physics B, 
but I do want to just point this out just briefly uh, when we're talking about velocity. This is how you would calculate your velocity at a particular instant. Now, one thing that I do want to talk about, and let me just open up a blank screen here so I have some room to write. Uh, let's suppose for a moment I travel from my initial position right here to some final position right here, and I take some path that maybe goes something like this. Now, looking at this, we can see that my displacement looks something like this. It's a straight line going from my initial position, x0, to my final position, x final. All right, so this dashed line right here that I've drawn, actually let me make this a vector, put a little arrow there. This is my displacement. Okay, and obviously my velocity, we've talked about this before, my average velocity is going to point parallel to this. <laughs> However, my instantaneous velocity is always going to be tangent to the path. Okay, so like right here at this instant, my velocity is going to be something like this. At this instant, my velocity will be something like this. Here, maybe something like this. Here, maybe something like this. So notice it's always tangent to my path. And that's a, a kind of an important concept that we'll use uh, from time to time throughout the year, is that your instantaneous velocity, so the velocity you're traveling at at any particular instant, is always tangent to the path that you're taking. Okay. However, your average velocity, and this is what we'll be using most of the time, is always parallel to your displacement. I'm sorry, yeah, parallel to the total displacement. So, in the previous slide, I said that your velocity will sometimes change, right? So, if you push on the gas pedal, you'll, uh, your velocity will increase. If you push on the brake, your velocity will decrease. And so now I want to talk about how we can describe that change in your velocity. And to do this, we use the acceleration. So acceleration is defined in pretty much the same way that we talk about average velocity. So your average acceleration is the change in velocity divided by change in time. Right? And again, this delta is final velocity divided by initial velocity. Right? It's a change in velocity. Now one thing I should point out about this is that I made a point when we talked about average velocity, that my average velocity was parallel to my displacement. However, my average acceleration isn't necessarily going to point parallel to my velocity. It's going to point parallel to the difference in my velocity, the change in my velocity. And sometimes that's not going to have a very intuitive meaning, and you'll see that throughout the year. So this, this is not necessarily going to point in a, a very obvious direction all the time. Actually, before I move on to the next example, I do want to point out one other thing about acceleration. Uh, so if we consider, for example, an object that's moving to the right with some initial velocity, and it has some acceleration that points in the same direction, this acceleration is going to cause the object to speed up. However, if I have an object that's moving, say, to the right, and my acceleration points in the opposite direction, this acceleration is going to cause the object to slow down. And when an acceleration causes an object to slow down, we sometimes call this deceleration. I'm pretty sure I spelled that wrong. Um, <laughs> so deceleration is any acceleration that causes the speed of an object to slow down. Now, one thing I should point out about this is, you know, looking at this, you could say, oh, well, my velocity is in the plus direction, my acceleration is in the negative direction. You know, anytime my acceleration is the neg negative direction, I have a deceleration. That's not true, okay? Uh, just because your acceleration is negative does not necessarily mean that the object is slowing down. Uh, for example, if I consider, say, an object that I release from rest, okay? And when we release an object from rest, we'll talk about this in the next video, the object will accelerate downwards with an acceleration equal to 9.8 meters per second. That's the acceleration due to gravity. Okay? When an object falls down, we call that acceleration negative. We call up positive and down negative. So if I drop an object, my acceleration is negative because it's moving down. However, the object will speed up, right? If you take an object and you release it from rest, it's going to speed up. It's going to accelerate towards the ground, okay? So just because your acceleration is negative 
like the acceleration due to gravity is negative, it doesn't mean that the object is necessarily slowing down. It doesn't mean that you have a deceleration. You can have a negative acceleration that causes an object to speed up. It just means that the object will speed up in the negative direction, right? So for example, if I release an object from rest, its velocity will increase, but its velocity will increase in the negative direction, right? It's going to be moving downwards, and downwards is the negative direction. Uh, one other thing I should point out, let me erase this deceleration, probably spelled wrong. Uh, one other thing I should point out uh, about acceleration is what happens if my acceleration wasn't uh, parallel to or in the opposite direction of my velocity. So what if I have like a velocity that points to the right and acceleration that points down? Uh, anytime you have an acceleration, your velocity is always going to rotate towards your acceleration. So for example, if I have some acceleration that points down, and this is my initial velocity, sometime later my velocity might look like this. Notice it's rotating towards the acceleration. Here, it's rotating towards the acceleration because the y component of my velocity is increasing. Okay, But it's always going to be this way. You're always going to have your velocity is going to be rotating towards the acceleration. And this is why you'll sometimes hear people say that velocity follows or it chases the acceleration. That's what we mean. Is that the velocity vector is always rotating towards the acceleration vector. So let's go ahead and look at a couple simple examples. The first example says, while driving you're stopped at a red light. When the light turns green you begin to accelerate. 30 seconds later you're moving at a velocity of 25 meters per second. What was your acceleration? Okay, so the very first thing you want to do whenever we're presented with a word problem like this is you want to figure out what information is given to you in the problem. So looking at this we can see delta t was 30 seconds. And my final velocity is 25 meters per second. Now, in addition to this there was one other bit of information that wasn't explicitly given to you as a number. So if we read the problem, it says while we're dry, I'm sorry, uh, while we're stopped at a red light. So this means initially I'm stopped. So my initial velocity has to be zero meters per second because I started out stopped. Okay. Now we wanted to calculate the acceleration. The definition of acceleration or average acceleration is delta v over delta t. So delta v, that's v final minus v initial, divided by delta t. Plugging in my values that I have, so I'm going to have 25 meters per second minus 0 meters per second, divided by 30 seconds. And if I plug this into a calculator, I get 0 0.83 meters per second squared. So that was my acceleration. So let's look at another example. This is another pretty simple example. It says, while driving 25 meters per second, you see a red light. You begin to decelerate at a rate of minus 1.5 meters per second squared. How long does it take you to come to rest? So again, looking at this, we want to find our known and unknown variables. Well, our initial velocity was 25 meters per second. Now the problem wants to know how long does it take for the car to come to rest, so my final velocity must have been 0 meters per second if I'm going to come to rest. And my acceleration is minus 1.5 meters per second squared. And what I'm asked to solve is how long it takes. So I'm trying to find delta t. Again, going back to the definition of acceleration, acceleration is delta v over delta t. So solving for delta t, we get delta t is equal to, so I'm going to multiply the delta t over here, divide by acceleration, delta v over a which is v final minus v initial divided by a. So that's going to be equal to 0 meters per second minus 25 meters per second divided by minus 1.5 meters per second squared. And if I plug this into a calculator, I get that this is going to be equal to 16.7 seconds. So I guess that's a, a very low deceleration here decelerating very slowly. Now one thing I want to point out about this is that I had to have a negative acceleration here. The other thing is that 
right? The delta v was v final minus v initial. My final velocity was zero. My initial velocity was 25. So when I take the difference between those, I get a negative number. I get negative 25. Okay. Had I messed up any of these signs, had I mixed up the order of the v final minus v initial, or I dropped the negative sign of my acceleration, I'd wind up with a negative time here. Okay. So almost always, when you have a negative time, that indicates that you made some kind of a dis uh, some kind of mistake. Okay. Usually, times changes in times are going to be positive. A delta t that's negative that means something that happened in the past. Okay. So at this point, we've pretty much gone about as far as we can with just looking at the definitions of things. And now, if we want to go any further, we have to start to make some additional assumptions. So now, what I want to look at is what happens if my acceleration is constant. Now the first thing to point out is if my acceleration is constant, then my average acceleration is just whatever acceleration I'm moving at, right? If my acceleration is constant, then the average is just my acceleration. The other thing is my average velocity. So if I'm accelerating at a constant rate, so that means my velocity is changing at a constant rate, then my average velocity is just the average of my initial and final velocity. It's just the mean of your initial and final velocities. Now, using this equation right here, and the definition of acceleration, and the definition for average velocity, we'll be able to derive, pretty much with those three equations, you can solve any kinematic equation that you're going to come across. And in particular, we can use these three equations to derive a couple of other formulas that are particularly useful to know. And so, I want to go ahead and introduce these equations uh, through a couple of examples. So the first example says, you're on the entrance ramp to I-64 and you start out moving 25 meters per second. You accelerate at a constant rate of 5 meters per second squared, and 10 seconds later you merge onto the interstate. How far down the ramp did you drive? Okay, so the first thing we want to do, again, anytime we have a word problem like this, is you want to figure out what information was given to you and what it is you're trying to find. Okay. So we started out moving 25 meters per second, so that's my initial velocity. My acceleration was constant, and it's 5 meters per second squared. 10 seconds later, so delta t is 10 seconds, and the question is asking me to find how far down the ramp that I go. So what was my displacement? Okay, so here are my known and unknown variables. Now, at this point, we only have three equations. We have my acceleration is equal to delta v over delta t. We have average velocity is equal to the change in position over change in time. And we also have my average velocity is equal to the average of my initial velocity and my final velocity. Now, looking at these three equations, there's only one equation that has delta v in it. Right? I'm trying to find the change in my position, so I have to use this equation. Rewriting this equation to solve for delta x, we see delta x is equal to v average times delta t. Now, if we look at this, I know delta t, but I wasn't given my average velocity. I was just given my initial velocity. So if I look here at this equation, I can use this to find my average velocity. So plugging this in here, I have that my average velocity is 1 half v initial plus v final, and then the change in position is that times delta t. Okay, well, I'm a little bit closer to solving this problem, but I'm not there yet because I don't know v final. That wasn't given to me either. However, I can find my final velocity using this formula over here. Acceleration is delta v over delta t, which is v final minus v initial over delta t. So solving for v final, this is going to be v final is equal to v initial plus a delta t. Right? My final velocity is equal to my initial velocity plus acceleration times change in time. So if I plug this into here, I'm going to have, well, let me move this move a little over to the left. This is going to be equal to 1 half v initial plus, this is v initial, plus a delta t, that was my final velocity, right? this whole thing here is final velocity, times delta t. And that's equal to 1 half, so 
we've got v naught plus v naught, that's 2 v naught plus a delta t times delta t. Finally, if I go ahead and I actually distribute this one half and acceleration, <laughs> what did I press here? Um, oh, there we go. Uh, so if I distribute the one half and the delta t into this, so we have one half times two, that's going to cancel, so this is going to give me v naught delta t, and then we'll have a one half a delta t squared. So in the previous uh, slide, we found that the change in position can be calculated as v naught delta t plus one half a delta t squared. Notice that I know all of these variables. I was given my initial velocity, change in time, and acceleration. So if I just go ahead and plug all these things into here, and I plug them into a calculator, I'll see that this is equal to 500 meters. So this is how far down the ramp I'm going to drive uh, before I emerge. So in this previous example, we found a very important formula. Delta x, my displacement, is equal to v naught times delta t plus one half a delta t squared. This is a very important equation to know. It's very useful to know this equation and not have to derive it every time. Uh, and important things to keep in mind is that this equation here depends on displacement, acceleration, delta t, and v naught. And it does not depend on v final. Okay, so if you're being asked about v final, this isn't an equation to use. If you're given delta t or you're asked to solve for delta t, this is probably a good equation to look at. Now one thing I want to point out about this equation is that we can actually derive this using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now as I mentioned before, AP Physics B is not a calculus-based course, so you don't need to know calculus. But if you're taking calculus or you've already taken calculus, this is a very useful thing to know. So I want to go over this just real quickly. So remember, the fundamental theorem of calculus says that if I take the integral from, let's say, a to b of the derivative of f of x with respect to x, dx, that this is equal to f of b minus f of a. Okay? Now, we said that my velocity is equal to the derivative of position with respect to time, so it's dx dt. In addition, I didn't mention this, but my instantaneous acceleration is going to be dv dt, right? Acceleration is change in velocity over change in time. So let's go ahead and apply the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus when my acceleration is a constant, so this derivative is a constant. Okay, so according to the fundamental theorem of calculus, if I integrate from 0 to t, of my acceleration with respect to time. Well, this is the integral from 0 to t of the derivative of velocity with respect to time. So this has to be equal to v final minus v initial, right? It's v at point t minus v initial. So let me say this is v of t minus v initial. And if my acceleration is constant, okay, if this is a constant here, if I integrate a constant from 0 to t, this is just going to be a times t. All right? If I integrate a constant, it's very simple, right? So from this, actually, the one thing I should point out about this is right away, right? this is uh, delta v is equal to a delta t. This is the equation that basically we just derived. Okay? Remember, this, this is just the definition of acceleration. right? So this is how you would calculate the formula for average acceleration. It just comes out of fundamental theorem of calculus. But now what if I want to find the change in the object's position? Well, in that case, I'm going to take the integral of the velocity. Okay, actually, I think I need a new uh, screen here. I'm running out of room. So in the previous thing, we found that velocity as a function of time is equal to my initial velocity plus a times t. Now if I want to find the change in position, I need to take the integral of my velocity. Right? Because the integral of my velocity is equal to the integral of the derivative of position with respect to time. And according to the fundamental theorem of calculus, that's going to be x of t minus x initial. 
Now, my velocity is given by this formula up here. So if I plug this into here, I'm taking the integral of v naught plus a times t. I'm taking this integral with respect to time. So here, again, if I take the integral of a constant, this is going to be v naught times t. If I have a times t, if I integrate that with respect to time, I get one half a t squared. So we see here that delta x, right, v final, I'm sorry, x final minus x initial is equal to v initial times delta t plus one half a delta t squared. So that's where this formula comes from. It really just comes from applying the fundamental theorem of calculus twice when the acceleration is constant. So we integrate the acceleration once, that gives us the change in velocity, and then you integrate the formula for velocity once to get the change in your position. So now I want to look at another example. In this example it says you move down the exit ramp of I-64 with an initial speed of 60 meters per second. You decelerate at a constant rate of minus 5 meters per second squared and you achieve a final velocity of plus 20 meters per second. How far down the ramp did you go before reaching this final velocity? So once again, the first thing we want to do is figure out what our known and unknown variables were. So my initial velocity, that was this 60 meters per second. My final velocity is 20 meters per second. My acceleration is 60 meters per second squared. I'm sorry, <laughs> that was my initial velocity. My final, I'm sorry, my acceleration was minus 5 meters per second squared. And what I'm being asked for is how far does the car travel down the ramp, so that's delta x. Okay, once again, we only have four kinematic equations. I'm sorry, three kinematic equations. We have my acceleration is delta v over delta t. We have the average velocity is equal to the change in position over change in time. And we have my average velocity is equal to the average of my initial and final velocities. Okay, so once again I'm trying to solve for delta x and only one of these equations has delta x in it. So solving for delta x I get delta x is equal to the average times delta t. Okay, now this is a little bit more challenging than the previous problem because I don't know either delta t or my average velocity. Let's go ahead and start out with plugging this in for average velocity. So this is going to give me one half v initial plus v final times delta t. Well this is a little bit better because I know my initial velocity and I know my final velocity, but I still don't know delta t. Once again, we're going to have to go back to acceleration to find delta t. So a is delta v over delta t, so delta t is going to be equal to delta v over a. Now if I plug this into here for delta t, this is going to be equal to one half v initial plus v final times, and this equation is going to be delta v, so that's v final minus v initial over a. So now what we have to do is we have to distribute. So we have one, let me go ahead and move this one over a out front, so we've got one over two a, this laptop does not like it when I write towards the bottom of the screen. So 1 over 2a, um, and here we have, let's see, so this is v initial times v final. Here we've got v final times v final. Right? Then we're going to have v initial minus v initial, so we'll have minus v initial squared. And then we have minus v initial v final running out of room here. Uh, so now we can see that the v initial v finals are going to cancel and this is going to be equal to 1 over 2a times v final squared minus v initial squared. So we found that delta x was equal to 1 over 2a v final squared minus v initial squared. And if I just plug in my known and unknown variables, at this point I know all of these numbers, so this is 1 over 2 times negative 5 meters per second squared, and it's very important that you remember to keep the negative signs. Here we have v final, that's 20 meters per second. 
squared minus v initial at 60 meters per second squared. And if I plug all this into a calculator, I see that this is equal to 320 meters. So this is how far down the exit ramp I travel. So in this previous example, we found the following formula for the displacement. The displacement was equal to v final squared minus v initial squared over 2a. Now at this point, I want to rewrite this formula a little bit. So if I multiply both sides by 2a, I get that this is equal to v final squared minus v initial squared. And that's going to be equal to 2a delta x. And then finally, if I solve for v final squared, I see that v final squared is equal to v initial squared plus 2a delta x. So this formula right here is the uh, second kinematic formula. It's a very useful formula to know. So at this point, we've got basically five formulas that are really useful to know. We have the definition of velocity, the definition of acceleration. We have that the average velocity is equal to one-half initial velocity plus final velocity. And then we have these other two kinematic equations, displacements one-half a delta t squared plus v naught delta t. And we have this formula here, v final squared is equal to v initial squared plus 2a delta x. Once again, looking at this formula, it's important to keep in mind what variables are involved and what variables don't appear. Here we've got displacement, acceleration, initial and final velocity, but delta t doesn't make any appearance. So if the problem's not asking about the delta t, delta t wasn't given to you as a known variable, then this is probably a formula you want to look at. Now one last thing I want to point out about this formula is this formula can actually be derived from the work energy theorem. So for those of you who remember the work energy theorem from last year, this says that work is equal to change in kinetic energy. And work was defined as force times displacement. Kinetic energy was one half mv squared. So the change in kinetic energy is one half m final squared minus the initial squared. And if I want to go just a little bit further than this, force is mass times acceleration. So this is mass times acceleration times delta x. Now if I cancel the m's and I solve for v final, I see that this gives me v final squared is equal to the initial squared plus 2a delta x. And I multiply the 2 over there, I get 2a delta x, and then I add the plus v naught over to the other side. Notice that's just the kinematic formula that we just derived. So this is really almost equivalent to the work energy theorem. And I'll talk about the work energy theorem a little bit later in the year. We'll see that there are some subtleties to the work energy theorem that make it very, very powerful. But at this point, it's a really useful thing to remember this formula. So if you remember the work energy formula, I'm sorry, the work energy theorem, you can use it to derive this kinematic formula. In fact, it's a really useful trick to just keep in mind all the time. So you can use the work energy theorem to derive this, and really vice versa. So at this point, I think I'd like to end the video. And in the next lecture, I want to talk about a very particular, a very specific example in which objects experience a constant acceleration. And that's when an object is in free fall.